And who better to break it down than our friend, the great Michael Wilbon, joining us now. Always good to see you, Michael. I know good that uh, Max and Stephen A. Thanks, cannot Molly. wait to get into this with you. But, Michael, just for a little context here, I'm assuming most people know, but you're a Chicago native. You know Michael Jordan. You know these Bulls teams intimately. I want the fellows to weigh in on this, too, but what has surprised you so far about the docuseries? Well, Molly, there are little bits and pieces that have surprised me, to, for starters, like Jerry Krause telling Phil Jackson, you can go 82-0 and 0 and you're still not coming back. I, I don't think I knew that in real time. <laughs> and even though mm -hmm. I knew about the, 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 the kinds of drama, sort of like drip by drip by drip, I think what has surprised me even in reliving it is uh, the amount of drama that Bulls had to manage. And by the Bulls, let's we, we talk about two different teams almost in those six championships. But Phil Jackson and Michael Jordan were the real managers. I mean, Jerry Krause, while he put the team together, managing the, the, the daily drama. I mean, the, the Dennis Rodman drama alone could have been a full-time job for somebody. But then you had, I mean, you had all sorts of, you didn't have things like, how many shots and whose team was it and how many minutes played the things that normally confront a basketball team. You had these massive things, whether it was dealing with Jerry Krause bringing Tim Floyd, another coach, into the team while Phil Jackson is successfully leading them to championships and Krause wanting to break up the team and the drama between uh, Scottie Pippen and Jerry Krause and Michael Jordan and Jerry Krause and Phil Jackson and Jerry Krause. And you had just episode after episode, Michael losing his father, being murdered during the time, you know, coming back. There's just so much drama that teams don't face anymore. I don't know that any successful team has faced it and managed it quite like those guys did. Michael Wilbon, it is always an honor and privilege to have my big bro on the show here, Appreciate sir. Appreciate that, Stephen um, A. Listen, if, 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 if you want to know anything about Michael Jordan from a media perspective, Ahmad Rashad obviously would be first on the list. I can make a legitimate argument that Mike Wilbon is second on that list. Make a damn sure before me. Let me be. Let me ask you this question: Watching these, watching the first eight episodes, who looks the worst? In this docuseries, you got people complaining about Jordan. I love what I'm seeing from him and his candor, but other people have been critical. People have been critical of Scottie Pippen. People have been critical of Isaiah Thomas. Who has taken the biggest hit in your estimation over these first eight episodes? Well, Stephen A., there's only one villain. There's one villain, and, I, and he's deceased. He cannot defend himself. It's Jerry Krause, because he the, the reason that you have a title called The Last Dance is because there was something final about it when it didn't need to be final. Remember, Michael has said many times, and before now, I don't know that it was pu as public as it is, certainly to, to, to people like you and me, that you play until somebody beats you. And that's what he wanted to do. Um, and Jerry Krause didn't want that. I mentioned bringing in Tim Floyd. I mean, you got Phil Jackson, a guy who's going to go on to win more championships as a coach than anybody in the history of the sport than anybody in the history of sports in North America, I think. And you want to get rid of him? You tell him he can go 82-0 and 0 and he's still not coming back? And it's, it's sort of unseemly at times to criticize Jerry Krause. Who, but, but you know what, Stephen A., and you know this, Max, I'm not sure how much you knew of Krause in real time, but Jerry was a villain when he was alive. He, he knew what he was doing. He was both brilliant oh, in the way he constructed he this team. You know, trading for Scottie Pippen before draft night, essentially, to get Seattle to be a partner in that move. Then trading Charles Oakley, which was unconventional, to say the least, to get Bill Cartwright and open up playing time for Horace Grant with one move. To get Tony Kukoc in the second round. To get all the people he did. I mean, it was, to bring in Phil Jackson, even though you know, people didn't want that. Michael didn't want that. He wanted to play for Doug Collins. Jerry Krause is the villain. He's got he's to own it posthumously. I know it seems tough to do that, but that you can't tell the story of any last dance or of the Chicago Bulls as they reach the end without Jerry Krause's enormous role in it. Mike, the old branch Ricky, trade him a year too early instead of a year too late. Of course, basketball is not baseball, and Krause came from baseball, originally basketball, then, then worked in baseball, and obviously the Bulls would have won a couple more championships. When you look at who else won the championships, how they fared against teams like Scotty goes to Portland, all, almost knocks out 
the Lakers, the year they win the chip, what would he have done with Michael Jordan and Tony Kukoc and company? So, so um, clearly, Krauss is the villain there. But Stephen A. has brought this up, and I've had the same thought watching it. Reinsdorf gets to sit there and kind of also point to Krauss. He's the owner. If he wanted to pay Scottie Pippen, he could have done it. If he wanted to keep the team together, the buck stops with him. So, the, the, my, and I don't, can't say it's surprised, but I, I, I feel a little bit like I want to take a shower after watching Reinsdorf sitting there helping focus <laughs> the villain light onto Kraus, who's not here to defend himself. Well, Max, you raised some good points, and, and people talk all the time. I have people call me and say, wait a minute, how come Jerry Reinsdorf gets a slide? And it's, there's something you have to consider before criticizing Jerry Reinsdorf. He's not like Jerry Jones or Dan Snyder or owner who just, uh, Mark Cuban, who owns an enormous share, if not all of it. That's not the case. Not then. I don't know what the percentage Jerry Reinsdorf owns now is. But I'm, I remember reading, certainly, that that percentage was like 13, 12, 13 percent. I don't know that Jerry Reinsdorf had the sort of autonomy, if you will, to do the things you're talking about. Jerry Reinsdorf had partners. I'm not saying it functioned like Brooklyn, because it obviously functioned a hell of a lot smoother than the Brooklyn situation with all the guys they had. But Jerry Krause was not the outright owner. People need to understand that. Majority, maybe, uh, the partner. Reinsdorf, I mean, yeah. he, 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 I don't know that he could have said, we're going to pay Scottie Pippen at the time, which would have been what? You know, $50 million total instead of 19 or whatever it was. I don't know that I don't know that he didn't, but I'm not sure he did. So we have to be careful about Reinsdorf and just sort of putting on him the mantle of dictator. He wasn't Jerry Jones. That wasn't mm -hmm. the relationship or the situation.